All right, so uh, previously we, um, I introduced you to the concept that we're using a virtual server, WAMP server, so that we can uh, install a WordPress, um, a WordPress site and work on it. And that was what we ended up with last time. We installed WordPress, uh, we had a basic site, then it was the end of the day and we went home. Well, now that we're here again on the second week, what we need to do is not start over per se, but we do need to reactivate what we had started previously. And because we only got up to about sheet number three previously, we didn't do the fourth sheet. And the fourth sheet is to archive our site. Because these computers, if you look on the corner, there's a little circle here, and that's a little polar bear. That little polar bear designates that we've got the software deep freeze which means that anything we do to these computers will be uh, frozen and therefore when you restart the computer everything goes back to our factory settings. So that means that we did our work previously and if we try to load it up again it's gone. So that's obviously good and bad. It's bad for you because well we'll have to start over one more time and if you saved something on the desktop like maybe you made notes and you saved it to the desktop or any folder in our computer, it'll be gone. Now the good thing about that is, well, what if someone got a virus on our computer? All we need to do is restart our computer and the virus goes away. What if someone defaced our settings or whatever? We just need to restart the computer and it goes back to factory settings. You see the good and the bad of having deep freeze. It's a public lab. I've worked in some colleges where they don't have any sort of freezing software and honestly it's chaos because someone puts in their favorite cat picture in the background and someone hates cats so they put in a dog and then someone puts in something else and they save their files there and someone messes with someone else's files it just doesn't work in a public lab on your computer obviously everything that you do at home stays on your computer on our computers here I believe on all of the computers on campus they've got deep freeze anything that you do on these computers delete unless you save to a flash drive the thing is that when we created our sites previously uh, we, we cannot simply just drag the folder of our site onto our flash drive and go home because WordPress is complicated. It's using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, and MySQL databases. So all of those files may not transfer when you simply drag the folder to your flash drive. So what we're going to do, and I've got it all typed out on sheet number four, at the end of the day together, we will archive our site so that then that will give you a file to take home and then you can work on it at home or when you come back next week we won't have to start from scratch again we will just resurrect our site we will just bring back our site from this week and get up and running much faster but we'll have to start over one more time today and next time we won't have to start from the beginning we will just bring back our site uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves we're not on sheet 4 yet so we do need to set up our site one more time. And basically, I'm going to be looking at sheet number two. Uh, sheet number one is all about downloading WAMP server, which it's already downloaded. It's already installed. We just need to, to launch the WAMP server app, and then we can go to sheet two. So on your desktop, you should see the purple or the magenta WAMP server icon, a little W. Double click that. Again, you don't get any pop-up, any feedback that says welcome to WAMP. What you will get on the bottom right corner is a little W that goes from red to orange to green. When it's on green, we're ready to go. That means it's installed, it's ready. So following my sheet here, we need two things. We need the WordPress software and we need a database for this to run on. So we've already got the WordPress software downloaded. Let's go ahead and open your computer window. This time we'll go to the local disk C, C as in cat. So open local disk. And you will see a folder called WordPress. So this folder, we're going to copy it and paste it into our WAMP folder. So once you see the WordPress folder, right click it, copy. we can copy the whole folder that's the software um, right click copy that 
then we're going to go into the WAMP folder. You see right above it alphabetically, you'll see the WAMP folder. Double click that. Then you'll see a www folder. Double click that folder. www. And then on the empty spot of the window, right click, paste. I'll take a moment because it's copying about 20 megabytes worth of stuff, but that'll give us a copy of our WordPress software so that we can continue. Okay, so that was uh, section. That was step one on sheet two. We've got a copy of WordPress in our in our WW folder. Step two. Well, we need a database. So I'm on sheet two, step two. Uh, basically, I'm saying go ahead and go to your web browser. So open any web browser. I'll just get Firefox. Doesn't matter. Open your web browser, and we'll go to that address listed there on step two a. which is localhost, just one moment, localhost slash php my admin. If this doesn't work, if php my admin doesn't load up, that means WAMP server is not running. So anyway, once we're here, you want to click on databases at the top and then create a database there. So according to my instructions, we're going to create a brand new database called WordPress. That will keep it easy. So type WordPress there and then click the button to create the database, or else it won't create the database. All right, so we put the software into the right folder. I am creating a database called WordPress here. Don't forget to click Create. You should get a pop-up that says Database WordPress has been created. If you try to create it again because you didn't notice the pop-up, it'll complain. You can't create the database because it already exists, clearly. I can see it right here under the database list. 
and I can see it on the left side. So don't try to click it over and over because it only lets you do it once. So I've got the database called WordPress now. This is step two. Step three is, well, we've got the software. We need to connect it with the database. So up on your address bar, I noticed some of you, unfortunately, this is something about Google Chrome. If you're using Chrome, Google Chrome, you will have to type HTTP colon slash slash. Looks like if you're using Firefox, you can skip that part. But anyway, go to localhost slash WordPress. We've got that folder called WordPress within our www folder. As I said previously, if you create any number of folders in the www folder, then they will behave like a website. They will behave like a real website that you can access in Dreamweaver or WordPress or any other software. So I went to localhost slash WordPress and it jumped me to the setup screen. Again, we'll have to do this again today, but next time we won't have to start from scratch. We're going to start with a site with the site that we end up with today. We'll, that'll, we'll get to that later. That's sheet four. So I'm going to select English. Um, just some notes here, what I need to proceed with. So let's go. <coughs> Name of the database is WordPress. We just created a database called WordPress a moment ago. According to my instructions here, what's my username? Root. Root. Very good. And according to my instructions, what's the password? Blank or empty. Nothing there. Not literally blank, not literally empty, but nothing there. And then on the database host, we leave that alone. And on the table prefix, we leave that alone. So we just needed to make sure our username and password were set. And then we can click Submit. If something happened, like it can't find your database and such, it'll tell you at this point, mine seems to be OK. So I will run the install. You want to raise your hand if you need any help? So at this point here, uh, we're going to uh, fill in a site title, username, password, and an email. You can make this up completely if you want. I suggest if you do, write it down because I won't have access to your, I won't know what your username or your email or your password is. On my sheet here, I do suggest on step 3G, and H, I do give you suggestions for the username and password. So if you use your own, make sure you write it down. So I'll, I'll help you in just a moment, but I'm creating Victor's Bakery, username admin, and a password of password. And then an email to retrieve your information and uh, search search box at the bottom, you can leave it as is or turn it off, it doesn't matter at this point.
Okay, so um, if you follow my suggestions on my sheet, I'm saying username admin and password is password with a capital P. Uh, if you use your own password and username, make sure you write it down. And so I'm going to install WordPress. Allow search engines doesn't matter at this point, but I'll just click install WordPress. 
what that will do is it will connect the WordPress software to that database. That database is very important because that stores everything about your site. It stores the title of your site, your users, passwords, content, pictures, everything. That's why we cannot simply just drag the folder. Uh, we cannot simply drag this folder, this WordPress folder, to our flash drive. It would be incomplete. That's why I have sheet number four that we'll look at at the end of the day. I get a success, so I'm going to click log in. And now go ahead and log in with the username and password you just made a moment ago. And if it worked, we will see the WordPress dashboard. Once we have the WordPress site set up, um, to remind ourselves very briefly, remember we're in the dashboard, the control panel, this is where we edit all aspects of our WordPress site. What do you have, what do we have to do, remind me, what do we have to do to look at it like a regular user? Yes. Yes, so hover over the name of your site, mine is Victor's Bakery, hover over the name of your site and click visit site. That will allow us to alternate back and forth between the front end, which is what users will see, and the back end, if you hover again, dashboard, front end, back end, visit site, dashboard. Let's get used to that. You should actually simply be able to <laughs> click the name of your site, and that's a shortcut too. That'll switch you back and forth. What you can also do is, for example, you can right-click New Tab, and then you can have one tab where it's the front end and one tab where it's the back end. or separate windows, or whatever you'd like. But um, I've got the dashboard here. So WordPress, at first blush, can be complex software. We have all these menu items here. Previously, we looked at the settings menu. I'm not going to go through them again. You want to check your notes or watch the video to see what I said about settings. Today, we're going to move on. So. Um, the big thing that I want to stress right now is that we have two main types of screens on our site. We have either posts or pages. Um, WordPress calls them both articles. So we've got pages or posts. The big difference between pages and posts is that a page is a screen on your website that doesn't change often. Like an about screen, a contact us screen, Maybe even the home page itself, the home screen, maybe that really doesn't change. So it's, it's screens that don't change, that don't need to change, really. Of course you can change them as many times as you want, but the definition basically is they, they don't change. Those screens don't change. Posts really are related to blog posts. And if you know anything about blogging, it's just a website that updates on a regular basis. Maybe once a month, once a week, once a day whatever. Someone can, can add to their blog as many times as they want, and that updates much more than a page. So posts are going to be all of your blog posts, basically. And pages are going to be every other page. When we get to uh, actually having e-commerce, we're going to have a page that is our catalog, a page maybe of search results, a page of the shopping cart, and that sort of thing. And posts, we won't deal with them too much because it's not the class for it, but posts would be where we've got blog posts. At the moment, we have one of each. If we visit site, we have one blog post, the Hello World blog post that was added today. And then also, uh, it's actually not obvious at the moment, but we have another page called About. And it's not obvious because one of the confusing things about WordPress is that sometimes, depending on the design, you will have an easy to navigate uh, nav bar on your site. By, by, what, by that what I mean is, for example, our college's website, we have a nav bar at the top. Programs, student services, job training, organization. At the moment, our site does not have a nav bar. Uh, it's kind of odd, actually. I don't have one. Do you see anywhere that says maybe like home or about? Yeah, I don't think we have it. Kind of odd. 
that's that's what I'm saying. That sometimes you don't have those nav bars, but trust me, we do have a we do have a an about page. We'll see it in a moment. Let's go. Uh, let's go back to the dashboard. If you're not there already, hover over posts, and you'll see all posts. Add new categories and tags. Hover over posts and select all posts. And there's the hello world post. So we can see the same thing under pages. If you hover over pages, all pages, you'll see we have what's called sample page. We've got a sample page page on our site. So I want to create a brand new post. Let's say I am going to integrate blogging into my site because if you take the SEO class that I also teach, the search engine optimization class, one of the one of the things you want to do to help improve traffic to your site is to to blog on your site. Obviously that's out of our scope in this class, but I just want to create one blog post to see how that works. So if you hover over posts, let's click on add new. <coughs> add new post. Not a page, we'll do that later. Posts, add new. If this were, if we were thinking ahead and this were our, our real website, what might people be interested in reading in your blog post? In your blog posts. In my blogging class, we have an activity there where everyone can volunteer to talk about what their website is and we brainstorm ideas. So I suggest you take that class if you would like to learn how to blog. But the short answer is, your blog post really is going to be full of articles, full of posts, full of content uh, on topics that your visitors might like or care about or want to subscribe to or, or to read, obviously. So let's say I've got this website, Victor's Bakery. Um, I could say that I'm going to put like a recipe of the week. I'm going to give away a free recipe every week on my website. Maybe not the original copyrighted recipe for my amazing cupcakes, but a variation of it. And the point of that is more traffic. If people know that every week or every day or every month I'm going to be blogging something, they're going to come back to my site. And maybe when they're on my site, they see there, sale today, a dozen cookies, five dollars. They might buy something. So there's a whole art and science to SEO. But what you want to get out of it at the moment is, if you, if you blog, that could bring you traffic to your site. And obviously I want traffic on my site to sell a product or whatever I'm doing. So let's write our first blog post here. And we might be tempted to simply write, you know, welcome to my site, I hope you enjoy it. Okay, that's minimal. What, why would people enjoy your site? Why would they come back? Why would they care? So I'm going to start off maybe with a title here. You've got a, a space at the top to title your, your posts. I'm going to call it Welcome to Yummy. Obviously this might not apply to your site. I'm just applying it to my own site, Victor's Bakery. You know, what sort of eye-catching sentence might you entice people to read your blog with? If I'm an auto mechanic and I sell, you know, refurbished auto parts, I might say something like, open for business, the best in San Diego. You know, what, how do I catch people's attention? And this is an art and a science and it takes time and effort to learn how to blog. We're not going to do it too much in this class. But in the actual content area here, I have then the ability to write whatever I want. I have some basic editing features like bold and bullet points, alignment and links. I can add pictures and sound and video. But I'm going to say, well, I'm going to say Victor's Bakery is now open for business. Subscribe to the blog. To get the latest recipe of the week. And then maybe I would put in a picture of a really enticing baked good. I'm not going to go too far into this, but this is the point of the posts. 
some, some new article that I'm putting out on a regular basis. Once a month is fine, once a week is better, once a day is best. Obviously that's a lot more work, but in that blogging class we brainstorm with anyone that wants to take the class about what to write about. So this is enough for the moment. Question? Um, I'd like to ask a question regarding the media, is that this is a appropriate time for it? Sure. Um, can you, is there a limit in that particular post to how many images you could post? Well, that's a good question. There's a, technically no limit, but there would, there would be a practical limit. Because if I put 40 pictures here, that's going to take a while to download. Every time someone visits a website, they're downloading various things, the text, the pictures, the video. So if I've got 20 pictures, all of them need to download, and my site might feel slow. If on my blog posts or on my pages, I've got a lot of pictures. Now, that's a deeper question about the balance between picture visual quality and file size. Because if I put in, let's say, one picture, but that picture straight out of my digital camera, which is a 20 megapixel image, that's going to download very slowly with just one picture. But if I have 20 pictures and I've used Photoshop to optimize them, to shrink them down dimension-wise and file size-wise, I may be able to have those 20 pictures load up quickly. That requires that I have a little bit of experience in, in graphics, you know, graphic editing. So no limit on a technical level, but on a user level and such. I want to make sure I don't have so many that I slow down my pages. Do you have a guideline like how many pixels? Or... No, it really, unfortunately, it depends on many things like the design of your site. Because if you've got a lot of pictures, maybe a certain design or theme will accommodate them in a nice you know, horizontal row. But maybe you've got another theme that will only show you three, three per row and then the last one goes to the next one. So it's about the design, it's about how many pictures you want to or need to show, and how fast you want it to download. We can do thumbnails, so a small version of it, and then linking to a large version of it, so it's more complicated than an easy answer, but it really is a balance. And, and, and one more question, mm -hmm. to photos. Uh, can you also put a caption underneath them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we, add act when we actually add pictures and such, like products, we will definitely be able to put captions below the picture so that we can see the picture and get some nice description below it. So this blog post is going to be our first one. We'll revisit it because we have other options here, like what are categories and tags. These will make more sense and be more relevant when we talk about products. But in short, categories and tags are a way for people to find your content on your site. So later on, let's say I've got a, an apparel company selling clothing. I'm going to be selling men's clothing, women's clothing. Those could be categories. I could be selling large size, small size. I could be selling, you know, variations of products. So if I categorize and if I tag my products, I'll be able to find, or my users will be able to find my products a lot easier. But at the moment, we'll just simply click on the top right, Publish. Question. Can you have the SEO, so someone type in Google, you know, men's clothing, and I tag that in the right? Yes, that is helpful, yes. So categorizing and tagizing are, uh, are useful for your SEO, and we'll touch on it a bit more. But um, they'll be much more important when we talk about our products. So in the top right corner, I'll click Publish. So it's just now just leave the tags open? Yeah, I, I don't really have an idea of what to put tags and categories just yet. When we actually have products, it'll make more sense. So I clicked Update, and then on the top right, this box shows that this has been published. It's visible to the public, and it's been published on this day. The good and the bad about WordPress is that we can change these things. But why would it be possibly bad for this? Um, publish date. I could backdate or forward date posts. So let's say I wanted to put out a post about our five-year anniversary, but I forgot. So a week later, I write a blog post about our five-year anniversary, I publish it and set the date here to be on that day. 
Well, the good about that is, obviously, that it um, shows up with the date that I intended. The bad is, and this will make sense later, if I had any tweets that were pointed to that original article, or any Facebook posts, or any Pinterest pins, if I had any links to that other post, and then I changed the date to a different date, those links will break. Because these posts are relying also on the fact of, the, of when it was published. Do you see up on top here, our permalink says, this was published, look at the address. This is the full address to look at this blog post. It's got the date, 2015-09-21. So if I were to go in and change a different date, and I had 20 tweets pointing to my original post, they're going to point to the wrong, to the wrong address, and therefore broken links, and broken links is bad for your SEO. So even though it's very easy to edit published dates, I would use it rarely because it's especially if you've already getting if you're already getting traffic to st suddenly start changing the structure of your site and causing broken links, the search engines don't like that. And yes. You you could someplace else you could change the the structure of the permalink, mm -hmm. uh, including deleting the date. Mm -hmm. When we were here previously, um, to give you a preview, settings, permalinks. You can go in there to remove dates. So that might be a way to help you, but broken links might still occur. And later on I'll talk about recommended plugins, and there's a plugin that will help you with broken links to redirect a broken link to the correct link all the time. So just for now, you could just leave the date. I would leave the date, yes, the default date. Question? Question, yes? So let's say you post in, oops, I had a typo. Now, can you fix it? Or is it yeah. like now it's installed in the beginning? No, that's perfectly fine. We can go back and edit our, our any of our content. The, co the content of our content, we can edit that, no problem. But uh, the dates and published dates and such, that might be a little more problematic. Yes. Okay, so these posts are for people who sign up for your blog or Anyone can see these, so if they come to my site, they will see this in my blog posts section. Uh, and if they subscribe to my site, they will also get an email that shows them the blog post. So it's for subscribers or for anyone. Yes. Um, can I use this setting for for the post that I want to publish? Like I write, same as a graph. And edit the date that I want. Yeah, no. I can do that also. Let's say uh, if I'm if I'm going to I spend a weekend and I write three articles, three posts, but I'm going to publish one this month, one next month, and one in two months. I can set this on a future date, and then it'll automatically publish on the future date, and that's perfectly fine. People do that all the time, because not until it is actually published does it actually exist for people. It's just in the database. So if I do future date it before I click publish, I will then publish whenever I tell it in the future. And that doesn't hurt anything. We've got um, visibility public. If we take a look at that, this is pretty useful here. So if you click edit there, we've got public. Stick this post to the front page. Uh, if you do decide to blog, the the default behavior of a blog is that the latest blog post will push the old ones down. So if you've added five blog posts after today, this one will be on the sixth position down on the screen. Well, I can stick these. I can stick a post where it'll always be first. Maybe people are always asking you over and over. Maybe you're selling a, a technical product, like I bought, did I mention it in this class? I bought, uh, I'm into photography, and I bought a, a light cube. It's this big six by six uh, f foot cube where a person can stand inside, you control the light, take some nice photos. Well, it, it opens up six feet, but it can actually collapse down to that size. So I had a hard time closing it the first day. So I went over to the, to the manufacturer's website, and at the very top they had how to close the light cube because everyone's having trouble with it. So if you stick a post to the front page, it will always be visible, like a frequently asked question. We can put this on private, so it's published, no one can really see it except you. So that's sort of like to keep it in a draft mode, in a sense. Um, 
related to that is password protected. If I select that and I put in a password here, that's a basic way to kind of get like subscribers with VIP content and such. Uh, I can have people access my articles only until they have a password. It's not as full featured as a real kind of plugin that has, you know, payment for this and password retrieval and all that advanced stuff. But this is a quick way to protect a post limited to certain people with a password. I'm not going to change anything here. And then we've got status published. And here's another way to, to, to kind of delete it, not delete it, but to hide it and such. Here we do have draft and pending review. I have to look up exactly the big difference between visibility private and draft. I know there is, but off the top of my head, usually personally what I do is I put things in draft. I don't put them in private because it has happened that if I had published the piece and then put it to private, people might still have the link saved on their web browser to go back to it, even though it's technically private. But if you put it on draft, it definitely removes it from any, you know, user accessible path. So I do this sometimes. I put it on draft, make updates, um, make it published again, and then the, the latest version appears for people. This format screen, we can publish different kinds of content. None of these are better than others, but these are, these are sort of for your organization, just like categories and tags are useful for organization, and these could be useful for your SEO also. So if, I, if on my blog posts, I have a series of posts where maybe I share also a 30-second recipe, I could categorize them, I could put them under the video format. So when people search within my site, they will see all video content. When people search on Bing, Yahoo, Google, whatever, they could see my post as well. If you have it on standard, it's not bad. But if you do have it on one of these more specific ones, it might be better. Yes? That one is like you've got main content that's kind of coupled with something else. You've got a standard post, which let's say has uh, 500 words, and then there's a sentence in there that's something like, you know, read more here. And you click on that, and that takes you to this one, which would be the aside with like, let's say, 50 words. So it's like related content to the main content. It's side content. Yes. Photographs. Yes. Would that be the format? <clears throat> that might be the better format. Yes, if you've got multiple images you want to show per blog post, gallery might be the best one to use. Do you have one choice? Yes, it's one or the other. It's not multiple. But you can change them each time you make a post. Yes. On a per post basis. Mm -hmm. So if you did make any changes here, you can remember to click update. And I want to see how this looks like for people. How do I do that again? Get out of the dashboard? How do I view it? You can click on your site name at the top left. If someone were to visit my site, if I had victor.com, and they come to visit my page, my website, they would see that. There's my latest post at the top, pushing down the previous one. And that's what we have by default with WordPress. We have a blog post structure. <clears throat> yes? In the blog post, your format selections, mm -hmm. so, you know, I told you last time I pulled up my own website, or my own WordPress dashboard that I've already started. My formats, I don't have as many options, but I do have the most up-to-date um, WordPress version? WordPress installed. Is that because of the theme? Yeah, a lot of things relate to the theme, so I'll mention that a lot of times. When people ask me a question, I'm, I'm often going to answer, it depends on your theme. So when we get to themes, we'll see that the theme, which is the design of your site, also controls many aspects of the dashboard. Okay, so it might only support those. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Are photographs uh, protected once they're on, uh, on, on WordPress, or, or do we have to apply for uh, security? Well, um, if you mean like copyright protection or trademark protection, uh, on a basic level, yes. Once you publish your content and it's marked as yours, you know, simply on your site or maybe with a little copyright notice on the corner, then you have some protection that it is, you know, protected under copyright laws of the U.S. and such. But it's not protected in any way, as in, can someone download it? and print it or can someone steal it and put it on their own site? No, unfortunately for that there's almost no way to protect against that. We do have to realize that if we put any content online, any picture, any text, any video, really, if someone really really wants to steal that, there will be ways to steal it. So what the best way you can get a, a, away from that or have some protection, because I like to do photography and put it online, I just put my address, my web address on the corner. That's the best that I can do. Yes, someone could open it in Photoshop and crop that out. Someone could go in and use the, the, uh, the clone tool and remove my name. Yes, if someone really wants to steal my work, really, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm not going to upload my high-quality 10 megapixel images. I'm going to upload like a quarter megapixel image, you know, low quality, but enough to be visible pretty well on the web. So that could go also for my stories. Let's say I'm putting up poetry online. If someone wants it, look at this drag, right-click, copy. They got it. There's no way to do that. And there are supposed tricks where you can disable right-click and all of that, but still people can do things like, let's look at your code. Oh, there's the code. I can find the piece that I want. See how I've simply brought up the code there with a the keyboard shortcut? Really, there's no way to protect your work online from the people that really, really want to steal it. But if you do have your copyright notice or watermark and such, that does give you protection when it's time to bring out the lawyers. Yes. The, uh, the new post, mm -hmm. the uh, welcome to your mail, I, um, you know, and the format, I added the, I guess, uh, to get, uh, you know, you put a password in there. Okay, sure. It, and then it, it then it, um, the screen is protected by the welcome to your mail. Yeah, th that's the whole point of it. If you do put it on uh, on that password protected, someone needs the password in order to access that that article. Right, but in after that, they, the, the block itself, the name of it, welcome to Yummy Life, and then it, it came out protected. After I put in the, the checks, which is password. Oh, so you did put the password yeah. itself as protected? Uh, okay, I wouldn't worry about it just yet because it's still in our testing environment, but during the break, uh, I can check exactly. It, should just behave normally. We're coming up on a break very soon, so what I want to do is um, let's add a page. Let's add a page to see the contrast there, and then we'll take a break. So we want to go back to the dashboard. And if we hover over pages, hover over the pages menu item and select add new. So let's say we want an About Us page. We want a page for people to see what this site is about. So up on the title, I'm going to call it About Us. And if I then click in the editing area, we saw this previously. You type a title, you go to the editing area, and it fills in the permalink, which is the direct address to that page About Us. And what I would recommend for SEO. You can call this title anything you want, anything that makes sense, but I would recommend for the permalink to keep it simple, simply about. So by default it takes what you wrote in the title and it makes a permalink out of it. So if I had called this something like all about our amazing shop. It'll make an address that uses that. But then I recommend you keep it short, simply about, because that will help your SEO. It's becoming almost a standard that your site, any site, whatever.com slash about, is usually the about page. If it's called about us, 
about me, about the company, I would recommend you simply keep the address, the permalink, short, like that. If your current site is the long name, I'm not saying go out in Russian and, and, and change it, because that could create broken links. You want to wait for later when I talk about these broken link helping, these broken link helper plugins to avoid broken links. But if you're starting your site from scratch from the beginning, I'll be mentioning some of these common names and such. When we get to the contact page, we can call it contact the owner. But the permalink, again, as we'll see, I recommend that to simply be contact. The shorter the better. Uh, this is a, in a page. It's a page, but it's similar to a post, apparently. But notice on the pages, we don't have categories, and we don't have tags or format. Format, categories, and tags are only for posts. We have something here called page attributes, which the posts did not have. We still have the publish box right here. I forgot to mention featured image for the post, but here we can add a, a picture. It doesn't quite do too much on the about on, on the pages. But a featured image often is useful for your blog post so that people see a preview image before they click on your posts. Yes. Um, so if we had um, later on when we create the actual shopping cart we will have uh, a page called shop and all of our products will be listed there but it might be better if I've got a page for cupcakes a page for cookies and a page for pies so cookies pies um, and cakes are children of the shop page. There's subcategories, but we don't want to think of them as categories because categories are for posts. But they are subsections, subpages of a parent category. And when we do it for the shop, it'll it'll make more sense. But basically, it's you know a subpage, a sub a subsection of a of a larger of a higher level. We have the same editing tools here, which is pretty limited, but the very last icon here, Toolbar Toggle, go ahead and click that one, and you'll get a few more editing options, not a bunch of them like you would be used to in Word or other software perhaps. I think that's one of the drawbacks of, of WordPress, that it's rather limited in how you can format the look of your content easily. We can get plugins and themes and all of that to give us much more control, but this is enough to do what we want. Um, people always want to do columns and such, and that's not built in. Maybe the next version of WordPress will add that, but we can definitely look at plugins and themes. Let's say we want to write a little bit about about content, a little bit of about content, because about page does help your SEO. The search engines are going to value a site that has that has real information uh, where you can be reached at, where it's got your story and your, your information, your frequently asked questions, because these spam sites, they just want to put out their spam products out there and get, get buyers. They're not going to deal with creating fake profiles of, of their CEO, and they're not going to put out fake messages about their founder, their foundation, and all of that. So the search engines do value your site if you do put in a paragraph or something of real about content. Because this could include your keywords. Part of SEO is figuring out your keywords so that when someone searches on Google or Yahoo or whatever, my keywords could stand out to them. San Diego based, family owned bakery in the heart. Uh, East Lake, California. Our recipes are a modern twist on old world traditions. 
you don't have to write this exactly, but I'm just saying that I want to write content, and, and here I am throwing in all of these keywords. This does take time and effort. It's an art and a science, SEO, to write this content to be found. But put yourself in the shoes of people that are searching, people that you want to find you, your, your target audience. Who are you selling your products to? And so I've got the keyword San Diego. This is obviously going to appeal to people in San Diego. I would love to sell to people in Los Angeles or, or Austin or New York or Chicago, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a location there yet. But if someone is in San Diego, East Lake, Southern California, this would apply to them. Family-owned bakery. Well, this is really reaching, trying to reach a demographic of people that care about family-owned, which is which is a big demographic more and more, right? People care more about organic or gluten-free or family-owned or fair trade and all of that stuff. So I'm uh, hitting that keyword more specifically, maybe mentioning exact location and then recipes, uh, old world traditions. So right here I'm sort of thinking about how do I resonate with, with people. Uh, this is also an aspect. SEO is, is really overlapping in the concepts of marketing. Marketing is a form of advertising. Marketing is to get your your product or your brand or your organization or your nonprofit or yourself in front of as most people as possible so that they can buy your product, subscribe to your newsletter, donate to your nonprofit, hire you. Whatever it is you're trying to do online, you're going to do marketing to get visibility, to get found. So this was a little bit of marketing here, which bleeds into SEO. But the marketing here is, well, why would someone care about yet another bakery? Uh, well, we've our big thing is that we take old world recipes and put a modern twist on them. Maybe also put in here how we, you know, we source our products fair trade wise and so forth. So I'm not going to go much further here, but these are things you need to think about. What are these keywords? What's the story behind your company? If someone is searching for you, how are they going to find you? Put yourself in the in the shoes of your of your um, our audience, and are you are you reaching them? I'm going to click publish. I want to see what it looks like, so we will visit site. And this is when we run into that issue. Well, there's no menu defined on our site, so that I know I, I, I put a page, but I don't see it, and I know there's a sample page, and I also don't see it. So I'll show you how to set that up right after our break. We want to have a menu to see our pages, because the pages go in the menus, and the blog post is here on the home page, unless we change it. It's 1.50. Let's take a 10-minute break. We'll be back at 2 o'clock. I'll turn the printer back on if you still want to print. We'll keep getting some acclimation in WordPress and then proceed. Does anyone need a little help?